Hi, actually, I remember my first time coming to talk at, at a Stanford venue it was in 1994. Um, I actually carried a T3D module in a suitcase and uh, gave a talk on the architecture of the T3D. Found out later, everyone was very friendly, but about half the people in the room were for, worked for SGI and uh, were working on the Origin 2000 and all that, so. Uh, future colleagues. Um, anyway, today I'm gonna talk about uh, probably the most exciting thing going on in high-performance computing, which is really the convergence of artificial intelligence and high-performance computing um, in, a, in a good way. Um, so let me just start by setting the stage a little bit. We're as a civilization, a global civilization, as a, as a society, as, um, as a country, we're facing a lot of really big challenges that really require the application of high performance computing in, in enormous quantities to solve. Energy, um, we need dynamic storage to be able to make effective use of renewable technologies. We need to try to understand a lot better uh, how our climate is going to change and perhaps respond to uh, eventual remediation efforts. Um, obviously, uh, we all want to be healthy. We all want to uh, be in a position to deal with emerging threats, both naturally and, and perhaps from bad actors, and, and be able to take advantage of all the advances that are, are being made in, in studying the human genome, et cetera. If you look at the, the times uh, to do good, accurate simulations on these problems, uh, these, are, these are large supercomputers, and um, you know, spending seven days, three million node hours to simulate uh, the uh, uh, molecular interactions that are happening in a lithium ion battery or uh, a projected, if you were really going to do a climate simulation that actually had a fine enough grid to be able to resolve clouds um, on the CSCS uh, machine pit stained, uh, they're projecting something like 100 million node hours, around 840 days if they devoted the machine to it. Um, obviously, you know, runs of, of these scales just aren't really practical. And we need to do much, much more than just one hero run, right? We want to do, you know, sweeps across a broad set of parameters for things like, like climate. Uh, so we are, we are way short of the amount of horsepower that we would like to be available to a lot of researchers in a lot of critical areas. And this is kind of a bad time for us to then be running out of Moore's Law. Uh, you've probably seen this chart, 40 years of microprocessor trend data. We're still getting transistors, that top line. Uh, but single thread performance kind of tipped over and leveled off at the beginning of, of uh, this century. And um, you know, frequency is kind of maxed out. We're power limited. Uh, and as a result, you see the number of logical cores naturally uh, starting to increase very rapidly, and not coincidentally, that's about the same time that uh, GPU accelerated computing uh, started to be a thing. And so really when you look at, at this period of time, um, you know, this is, this is really now the, the rise of accelerated computing and more specialized architectures. Um, in a way, you can look at Moore's Law and the long run that it had over over the last 50 years, and in a way, it, it was kind of a back pressure on architectural innovation. But now with, with Moore's Law running out, um, you know, uh, architecture is becoming popular again, and you're starting to see a lot of diversification, especially in, in some fast-moving fields like artificial intelligence. You can see the effects in the top 500. The top line there is the sum of all 500 uh, the middle line is the number one system. The bottom line is the number 500 system. This is a log graph. Um, and you can see we've been doing pretty well on a schedule, uh, order of magnitude steps there. But we were supposed to get, uh, we were supposed to get 100 petaflops in 2015. And you can see really that all the lines are, are tipping over. Um, and of course, 
we just reached 100 petaflops this, this last year with, with uh, uh, Summit and, and Sierra. Um, the, you know, both of these supercomputers uh, uh, accelerated by NVIDIA GPUs, happy to say. But you can see that, that uh, even with acceleration, uh, things are a little bit late. Now, if you look at this chart, kind of all the way to the, the left of it, 1994, that's when I was walking around Stanford with uh, a very large and heavy suitcase uh, with a, a massively parallel processor module in it. And that, that was really a, a time of, of great transition. We were really running out of capacity and capability, horsepower, in the, and our ability to scale, to continue scaling vector machines with you know, large, powerful processors and flat shared memories, no locality worries at all. Um, our ability to scale those was, was being superseded by Moore's law driven uh, commodity technologies, right? And the T3D was Cray's first MPP. It used, uh, used DEC alpha microprocessors. And that really, for people who were able to make a transition and, and move their codes onto massively pillow processing architecture, to this distributed memory architecture that distributed computation and data uh, across many, many, uh, many, many independent nodes, which required a, really a complete rewrite of your application to take advantage of. Uh, if you made that transition, it puts you on an escalator, uh, Moore's Law driven, that would carry you through, what, five orders of magnitude over the next 20 years uh, in terms of performance improvement. Really great thing. Um, but where's the next five orders of magnitude coming from, right? Moore's Law uh, running out of steam. So we need something new uh, and uh, something really new is actually success in artificial intelligence really being driven um, by uh, HPC becoming really inexpensive in a lot of ways. So there's, there's generally acknowledged to be three ingredients for the modern um, explosion in artificial intelligence. One of these is big data. And um, I think everyone knows the role that we play uh, with our cloud service providers, with social networks, search engines, um, e-commerce sites, et cetera. We're the sensors. Right, we're providing the big data. They're monitoring everything we buy, every click we make, every every purchase we make. They're they're building models of us, uh, and of our preferences. You know what we like to watch and eat, and every, where we go, everything else. And they're using the, that that data mostly virtuously uh, to present us with services again over our mobile devices, which are becoming more and more intelligent. Um, they're um, they're providing us with, with, with services based on our data, right? Better search results, recommendations for your next movie or your next place to eat or whatever. Um, and, and we're uploading you know, millions of hours per year of video and photos and everything else. And, and, and just as that creates an enormous data storage and curation problem, for the, these cloud service providers, it also provides them with an enormously valuable asset, which is that data. And so they've been exploiting, this is the, the economic engine that's driving really artificial intelligence today. They're able to take our data, turn it around, and if they can use AI, use deep neural networks to provide a slightly better search results or recommendations, they're able to make money on that, right? They can service more targeted ads or whatever. Um, but it's not just data coming from us, right? It's, it's um, not only uh, uh, people who are providing this data, but it, you know, it's coming from devices, et cetera, and, and, and uh, uh, growing exponentially. And it's not only exploding in volume, but it's, it's changing in quality and kind as well, right? Um, you know, databases it used to be very structured with indexes. Data is no longer really structured. It's very unstructured. It's not just human origin. We have the Internet of Things. We've got machine-collected data just streaming 
onto the internet. Uh, data used to be transactional mostly. Now it's, you know, includes a lot of time series and video. Um, you know, it used to be business. Now it's mostly social records uh, in the past. Now it's metrics, et cetera, known, unknown. Uh, so it's really, it's really uh, changed uh, both in, in kind and volume. And the other ingredient, then the third ingredient, besides big data, uh, or the, the second ingredient besides uh, big data is, is uh, AI algorithms. And neural networks aren't new. This is a diagram of a perceptron. They, uh, it, a, a single layer, single neuron neural network invented in 1957. Uh, it was quickly, uh, <clears throat> uh, quickly um, became extremely popular for a very short time because it could be trained with data, and that was, that was novel. But it was proven that it could really only do kind of a linear separation of, of data. Uh, so it's very limited. Um, first nuclear AI winter uh, <laughs> followed, uh, and it was you know a couple decades before uh, people discovered that uh, you could actually train a hidden layer of networks. Uh, and this was in the, um, the 80s, uh, basically back propagation uh, uh, was, uh, was discovered then. It, propagating an error, you know, the, the error backward through the network and, and enabling you to adjust the weights, et cetera, and train that hidden layer. And, and that worked pretty well, gradient descent uh, uh, training, but with only a single hidden layer and the amount of data that people had in the 80s, um, there, were, there was lots of promising results, but they always fell short of conventional uh, approaches. And so there were very few applications, really only one or two, that uh, were, were successfully uh, taken on by artificial neural networks. And um, another, uh, another AI winter ensued until recently. Um, and um, in 2012, uh, you've all heard, I'm sure, of ImageNet. Um, ImageNet was, you know, prior to 2012, all the entrants, it was a, an image recognition and classification uh, contest, and people hand-coded uh, everything. And in, in 2012, uh, Alex Krasinski uh, trained a neural network on an NVIDIA GPU, his gaming GPU. Uh, took him, you know, like a week to train a neural network. Came in and, and just blew everybody else away. A, you know, it, progress had been uh, proceeding at you know one or two percent improvements in recognition rates, kind of per year, and he he made a massive step. And the following year, uh, over the next two years, pretty much everybody threw away everything, their life's work, all the all this code they'd been writing to segment images and try to you know uh, find edges and assemble you know some kind of semantic map and everything just threw away their life's work and and everything became learned from data uh, neural networks and the big guys got involved right away uh, after that google baidu etc and in a very short period of time uh, in in uh, 2015 the 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 uh, neural networks achieved really superhuman performance. They were able to actually uh, do better on recognition than a trained human who had studied the ImageNet data set. Um, so really one of the first of, of many narrow fields where AI over the next few years was going to uh, achieve superhuman results. And this really kicked off the, the Big Bang of modern AI. Um, you know, and it started really first with extensions of that kind of image recognition and classification algorithm, right? People could even take uh, AlexNet, as it became known, the trained AlexNet, trained on, on ImageNet, and that gave you a big head start. If you had another image recognition problem, you could start with that neural network and then train on, on your application-specific data set. And, and so there are, there are you know, thousands of uh, image recognition neural nets that, that uh, now have propagated from that. But really quickly, 
uh, neural networks got a lot more sophisticated. And so we have recursive neural networks that can handle time series. We have long-term, short-term memory uh, so that they can remember state. And um, they become uh, generative, not just classifying and saying, oh, there's a dog in that picture, there's not a dog in that picture, uh, or whatever. But they're actually now generative. They're able to generate images, generate um, a sound, you know, generate things. Um, and and, and that's, that's an important big step. Um, one use, this is a, a work that NVIDIA has been doing. Um, NVIDIA has, has a big investment in uh, uh, self-driving cars. We have a, a lot of uh, researchers who are actually world-leading researchers. One of the problems with self-driving cars is training set. You can collect a lot of training data just by putting a car uh, or a camera on your car and driving around and driving around, right? Um, but that uh, doesn't really give you driving in all weather, driving over the same streets in all times of day, uh, you know, putting, putting uh, uh, all kinds of dangerous uh, or really expensive kinds of situations together. And, you know, so what, what they actually have developed is, is a, a, uh, a generative adversarial network. This is a, GANs are, are really popular now, and it's really, it's a pair of neural networks. One of them that is trained to be a discriminator. It, it's like the harsh critic looking at the output of the other network, which is trying to, to fool it. It's trying to produce an output that matches the, the target output uh, as well as possible. And so that top image there really is uh, colors. It's a semantic map. So street, people, trees, buildings are, are colored different colors. And th this scan has been trained on uh, on uh, street scenes and car scenes, and it will create, it'll fill in all the pink with street. And you can, you can pick kind of pools of, of images that represent time of day or snow or whatever, and it will create all these different, um, different images for you, um, you know, really uh, very dynamically. So you can see uh, a couple of different scenes being selected, and it's just seamlessly changing them. And this is called data augmentation. Uh, it's where you have a training data set and you want to uh, have it represent more training situations and so you can manipulate it. And, and this is a very sophisticated uh, way, of course, of doing data augmentation. And you can use GANs to re really um, uh, do just a tremendous number of things. They can extract maps from photographs. You can give them a line drawing. They'll draw a purse or a human. There's now face generators that generate random people, and honestly, the detail is so amazing on them, you would swear they were real, but they're not. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very powerful technology. Even more weird is uh, WaveNet, for instance. Uh, WaveNet is a speech uh, generation, uh, text-to-speech uh, technology, and it basically, Gen, it's been trained on raw waveforms. It generates raw waveforms. Uh, and it does so with a recursive neural network architecture that constantly is shifting over and has keeping this long history of what that wave has looked like and what the text stream uh, has been driving it. Uh, so when you think about, uh, you know, this is, this is part of then what makes up like Google Translate when you think of these capabilities and, and the implications of what is being learned from the data by the neural network and, and how difficult it would be, impossible really, to try and express whatever that neural network has learned as an algorithm uh, without the, in the absence of the data that trained it. It would be, it would be many lives work, right? Um, and if you compare the quality of speech synthesis before and after neural networks or image recognition before and after, um, you know, there, you know, speech recognition before and after, uh, it's it's night and day. It's it's so amazing. So these are great, mind blowing capabilities. But what does this really have to do with science? Um, you know. It, 
HPC has been very good for AI, um, but what can AI offer for HPC? Why would we want to use this AI stuff for HPC? Well, there, there's, there's several, several, uh, uh, several really large potential values here. One of them is uh, AI is a new computing paradigm, so there's lots of white space. Um, you, you, know, you, can, you can move things along really rapidly. Uh, accelerated computing is new too, and you can see here looking at Amber's molecular dynamics um, uh, package, very popular, it's GPU accelerated. Uh, you can see that it's, you know, even though we're in this Moore's Law desert now, um, you can see that, that GPU accelerated computing is continuing to push forward. This is because GPUs are new, we're, we're improving the software stacks, we're improving compiler efficiency. GPUs are continuing to advance their performance because of their latency hiding architecture and that they're, they're very parallel. Uh, we're, able to, uh, we're able to power more transistors, have more uh, ALUs on a, on a device, and we're able to to uh, multiply the area of the silicon that we're employing. All these, all these things let accelerate computing be on a, on a different curve than conventional CPU-based uh, uh, computing. But if you look at AI, it's, it's even more astounding. Uh, it's been 12x in three years, actually 65 times speed up in AI training performance over the last five years. And this is, this is because AI is new, and so there's, there's lots of optimization space for us to explore. And so uh, if, you, if you want to, you know, those, those Moore's Law curves that we didn't like at the very beginning, if you want to be on that, that escalator, you might want to consider trying to apply these kinds of technologies. In fact, over the last year, if you just look at a 12-month period from uh, uh, the second half of 2017 to the second half of 2018, um, you know, with a combination, again, across the board, software, algorithms, and hardware, uh, and scaling, uh, you know, order of magnitude gain in training performance in one year. So another reason is it's kind of easy. Uh, it's software, writing software. If you have the data, um, you know, neural networks are, deep neural networks are, are universal function approximators. You can, there's a proof that actually with a, a single layer, um, you know, a single hidden layer, that if you make that single layer large enough and you have enough data, you can basically approximate any function. But when you have many layers, uh, it's much, much easier to actually do that in reality. And so, you know, functions are the building blocks of software, and uh, neural networks learn their functions from the data. So if you have the data set, a correctly labeled data set, we're not very good at unsupervised learning yet, but we're really good at supervised learning. So if you, if you can understand your data, and, and um, honestly, the, the uh, neural network field itself is very open about publishing, and the the, uh, uh, the math behind it uh, and the tools and the frameworks are all very approachable, very supportive. Uh, almost anybody can do it, but you can essentially, um, you can train a neural network to do almost any kind of function. And so, um, you know, this is, this is a way to get out of a lot of, a lot of typing yourself. Um, so, um, that's a good example. Also, it's incredibly powerful. People are doing things every day with neural networks that they have never been able to do with an algorithmic approach. So this is kind of an interesting one. So chaos is chaos, right? You can't predict it. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, neural networks actually learning to predict chaos. And um, and actually, the prediction goes out pretty far in time. On the left is, is uh, uh, a ground truth. It's a play, playing out of a, of a chaotic um, uh, uh, ramble of, of basically three variables. Uh, and 
many of those were, were done just, you know, and every one, even starting with the same conditions, evolves differently. But they use that to train neural networks. Um, and it, it's actually kind of a weird neural network. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a pool of neurons that are almost randomly connected. And um, it was able to learn the, the top one on the, the left side, basically. These are just single examples, but you know, there are many, many of these. And when you subtract that from the ground truth, the one that, that represents a, an algorithmic uh, approach that generated the training data, you can see that actually um, it gets out to, uh, uh, and I can't pronounce this, uh, it, they, they talk in terms in chaotic world of, of uh, Laya Punaf time and going out eight steps. And now actually there's more recent papers out there. They pushed it out to 12 uh, steps. And, and the reason this is kind of dimensionless is because depending on your chaotic situation, right, if it's, if it, we're talking about the climate, the amount of time or, or weather, the, uh, uh, the amount of time before, uh, you know, your weather becomes unpredictable is, a couple of days, right? And so you can tell our, our window of being able to accurately predict weather is really just numbered in some small number of days, right? Um, but there's other systems, you know, that, that devolve into chaos extremely rapidly, but they're, they're all, um, you know, relative in terms of the size of the, the system and how quickly it decays into chaos. But, but this, is, this is unique, being able to actually um, you know, this, this model that they're using is one that, that simulates a flame front uh, that's progressing. And, uh, you know, the potential of being able to predict, you know, how a fire is going to progress. Um, you know, being able to extend our weather prediction. Um, you know, the, the potential is, is mind-blowing to be able to predict things that mathematically we look at them and say, well, that's, that's chaotic. We can't really uh, make sense of that. So there's a lot of power there. And we certainly have big data in science. Um, and we have big computers, right? We're generating huge amounts of data. We have big data sets that we, we generate computationally. So, so you know, we seem to have all the prerequisites to take advantage of artificial intelligence. So I'm gonna walk, walk through a few examples of where AI is being used uh, for for science, this um, um, I'll start with kind of the easy ones. They're all really cool. Uh, this is a recognition and classification. This is the uh, uh, CMS. It's the compact muon solenoid. It's a, a detector in the Large Hadron Collider for scale. Um, there's a ladder here, uh, so that's human scale, right? So the uh, Large Hadron Collider is down right now. Uh, for an upgrade, they're going to be like you know doubling the power of it. It's supposed to come back online in about a year. Uh, one of the problems that they have is just the volume of data that's produced by these detectors during collisions, and it's it's such a stream that they can't collect it all for post processing. They have to try to analyze it as quickly as possible and throw away as much as they can just to make the storage and and analysis. Uh, tractable, and so they actually have had a couple of layers of, of triggering analysis that goes on. The first layer has been FPGAs running some algorithms, and they're they're looking at these patterns that the detectors are generating as a result of the the decay of the particles post collision, and um, so the the you know they're they're making a lot of decisions based on pretty crude algorithms that people have written and, and put into FPGAs. And then uh, the second level trigger uh, has been a big cluster of CPUs. What people are working on now is, is looking at using neural networks because one advantage neural networks have training is computationally expensive. It can take a huge amount of horsepower and take a long time. You're pushing potentially terabytes of data multiple times. You're exposing it to the the neural network as you're, you're converging the weights over, over you know, millions, billions, trillions of, of iterations. But once you have a trained neural network, it's single pass through, 
It's all matrix multiplies. It basically runs at peak on whatever device you have. Uh, it basically runs at the energy limit peak on a GPU. And so it's incredibly fast. And so what the researchers think they can do is have a first level trigger and a second level trigger that are much smarter, that are actually looking at patterns, they're training them with simulations and, and with real data. And, and they're getting great results, greater accuracy, greater discrimination than what they had with the previous algorithms. Uh, and, and so fast, they started looking at just uh, using neural networks for the second level trigger, uh, but now they're even looking at replacing the FPGAs with, with uh, uh, neural networks. So the algorithms in the FPGAs at least, if not the FPGAs themselves. Um, Another uh, application here that's really cool is using recognition and classification in a control loop. This is um, uh, William Tang, Bill Tang, and his uh, uh, team at Princeton. Uh, and what they're basically doing is trying to use, uh, trying to train neural networks to control the plasma in, in plasma uh, um, uh, fusion reactors, right, tokamaks. And so they've got access to uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a tokamak, and uh, they're, they're trying to prepare for this uh, big European uh, eater uh, tokamak that's being built that people think should be able to actually sustain fusion. Um, you know, there's lots of problems. You have this superheated plasma. It's being compressed incredibly uh, in these ma huge magnetic fields. And if it touches anything, it instantly cools, and, and it might do some damage. And um, so, you know, they have all these devices that can, you know, inject microwaves or you know other other um, you know ions to try and stabilize the 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 plasma. But they don't know when it's degrading. It happens really rapidly. It's difficult to detect. No person can respond. You know, the algorithmic approach is very difficult just to even detect that the plasma is going, uh, going um, uh, uh, awry. Um, and, and what they've been able to do so far is, is demonstrate a huge increase in accuracy and, and, and speed up as a result. And um, so they're actually now, uh, they have a, a, a smaller to uh, tokamak, that's uh, their research tokamak. And uh, they're getting ready to connect the neural network to the tokamak. Uh, and I know that sounds like the beginning of a plot for a science fiction movie. Um, but uh, this, this could be the path to you know, unlimited, really inexpensive electricity that has zero carbon footprint. Another control loop is using deep learning for adaptive optics. They're building these enormous com compound mirror uh, telescopes on the tops of mountains. Um, this is the, um, uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope, aptly named 39 meters. Uh, it's costing over a billion dollars to build on a mountain in Chile. Um, it's scheduled to go online in 2024, but they're already experimenting with a lot of smaller uh, telescopes. Essentially what they do is, is they fire lasers up in the direction into the sky in the direction the telescope's looking at kind of creates artificial stars that twinkle because of atmospheric turbulence. Atmospheric turbulence, even though these things are on top of mountains, there's still a lot of atmosphere above them. And really, it's that turbulence that makes the images blurry. Like this is a shot of the moon with an 8-meter telescope with adaptive optics off. And then they actually, they, they can analyze the twinkling of these artificial stars they're creating with the lasers and very quickly run it through some algorithms and then they deform the mirror. They have an array of actuators that slightly deforms the mirrors to compensate and you can get really sharp photographs as a result. So they're gonna have this enormous light gathering capability and also be able to you know, much, much larger mirrors than you could ever afford to launch into space. Um, and, and they'll be able to get very sharp images, sharp images as a result. And there's several of these in, in process. And they're using neural networks, training neural networks, to look at that, those artificial stars that are being created with the lasers and translate that into the corrections that need to be made to the, the mirror. 
This one's even more famous, and if, if it's possible, even cooler. This is LIGO, the laser interferometer uh, uh, gravity wave detector. And um, you know these things are the world's most sensitive motion detectors. They're a couple kilometers long laser interferometer, and you know they can detect everything, anything that moves within miles and miles of these things, right? Uh, and so the output of the LIGO detector is enormously noisy, and so they've had these denoising algorithms that they've been running in a cluster of CPUs. It's taken like two weeks of latency to process a, you know, a, a, a sample. Um, and that's a lot of latency. What they want to be able to do is what's called multi-messenger astronomy. So they want to be able to uh, listen for gravitational waves from some astronomical event like a couple of neutron stars spiraling into each other or black holes colliding or whatever. And um, they have now multiple laser interferometers spread around the Earth. They want to be able to process in real time what's taking them weeks now and be able to triangulate on what part of the sky the wave is coming from if you have these detectors widely separated on Earth you can detect which direction these waves are coming from. And then they want pagers to go off all around the world so that people can swing their optical telescopes and their radio telescopes to that part of the sky and try to simultaneously uh, image with photons um, you know, light from whatever the, the event was that caused the gravitational waves. And uh, very famously, uh, they were able to do this for the first time about a year ago. Uh, so um, a group at the University of Illinois, NCSA, has been working on, on uh, training neural networks to uh, filter the noise. They, they have, uh, uh, what you can see here, I'm sorry about the uh, eye test basically, but what they do is they take noise from the actual instrument and they inject a real signal from, from simulation of what the gravity wave should look like. So they're using a scientific simulation to generate a real signal, add it to wave, uh, noise coming out of the telescope, and they're training neural networks with that. And there's a couple of, of the algorithms that they were using, um, uh, that they were using uh, in the cluster of, uh, of CPUs. And not only are they uh, now with the trained neural network, much more accurate. Um, I don't, you can not hardly see the blue overlapping the black. The black is the ground truth uh, you know, of what you're trying to get. Uh, and the blue is what actually, or the, the black is the denoise signal, excuse me, dotted line denoise signal. The original one is the, the uh, uh, dark blue. And then the light, light what is that, teal, is the, um, the noise. And you can see this is the neural network. You can't really tell the difference between the original signal and the, and the extracted signal post-noise. And you, here you can tell not even close on the other, um, the other approximations that people, the other algorithms that people had hand-coded to do the same kind of denoising. Uh, so not only faster results, about 5,000 times faster, than what they were able to do with the cluster, um, but more accurate as well. Faster, more accurate. 5,000 times and more accurate. How often do you get that in HPC? I mean, we're pretty happy usually to get like 2x and, and similar accuracy or you know, modest accuracy increase. So those are really cool, and they're kind of using the things that we know, neural networks, we knew in 2015, in 2012, uh, that neural networks were good at recognition and classification, putting them into a control loop, that kind of thing makes, makes great sense. Um, in 2015, uh, one of my colleagues at NVIDIA, Chris Lamb, uh, who uh, uh, leads a lot of the, the software organization, we were traveling and he told me about this video he saw and he described it as somebody aimed a, uh, a camera and recorded a bunch of video of, of particles in a fish tank or whatever and they trained a neural network 
um, to, to infer Navier-Stokes uh, fluid dynamics. That sounded really intriguing, but that wasn't quite the case, and I kind of looked it up. But um, it, it, this is actually a paper that was published in 2015 at, at SIGGRAPH, and uh, uh, it got me really excited. And so I've been talking about HPC plus AI and, and this technique of using trained machine learning algorithms trained on data from first principles numeric simulations. Remember, that one of the biggest problems in AI is getting a, a well-labeled and sufficiently large supervised learning training set. Well, with scientific simulation, we can create those, as, as many data points as we want, as large of a data set, as varied as we want with our simulations. And so um, what they were doing basically was trying to train, uh, trying to train, in this case, it was uh, uh, a uh, uh, random forest. Uh, machine learning is, is mind-blowing to be able to predict things that Mathematically, we look at them and say, well, that's, that's chaotic. We can't really uh, make sense of that. So there's a lot of power there. And we certainly have big data in science. Um, and we have big computers, right? We're generating huge amounts of data. We have big data sets that we, we generate computationally. So, so you know, we seem to have all the prerequisites to take advantage of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to walk, walk through a few examples of where AI is being used uh, for, for science. This, um, uh, I'll start with kind of the easy ones. They're all really cool. Uh, this is a recognition and classification. This is the uh, uh, CMS. It's the compact muon solenoid. It's a, a detector in the Large Hadron Collider for scale. Um, there's a ladder here. Uh, so that's human scale, right? So the uh, Large Hadron Collider is down right now uh, for an upgrade. They're going to be like, you know, doubling the power of it. It's supposed to come back online in about a year. Uh, one of the problems that they have is just the volume of data that's produced by these detectors during collisions. And it's, it's such a stream that they can't collect it all for post-processing. They have to try to analyze it as quickly as possible and throw away as much as they can just to make the storage and, and analysis uh, tractable. And so they actually have had a couple of layers of, of triggering analysis that goes on. The first layer has been FPGAs running some algorithms. And they're, they're looking at these patterns that the detectors are generating as a result of the, the decay of the particles post-collision. And um, so the, the, you know, they're, they're making a lot of decisions based on pretty crude algorithms that people have written and, and put into FPGAs. And then uh, the second level trigger uh, has been a big cluster of CPUs. And what people are working on now is, is looking at using neural networks because one advantage neural networks have training is computationally expensive. Can take a huge amount of horsepower and take a long time, you're pushing potentially terabytes of data multiple times you're exposing it to the, the neural network as you're, you're converging the weights over, over you know, millions, billions, trillions of, of iterations. But once you have a trained neural network, it's single pass through, it's all matrix multiplies, it basically runs at peak on whatever device you have. Uh, it basically runs at the energy limit peak on a GPU. And so it's incredibly fast. And so what the researchers think they can do is have a first level trigger and a second level trigger that are much smarter, that are actually looking at patterns, they're training them with simulations and, and with real data, and, and they're getting great results, greater accuracy, greater discrimination than what they had with the previous algorithms. Uh, and, and so fast, they started looking at just uh, using neural networks for the second level trigger, uh, but now they're even looking at replacing the FPGAs with, with uh, uh, neural networks. So the algorithms in the FPGAs at least, if not the FPGAs themselves. Um, another uh, application here that's really cool is using recognition and classification in a control loop. This is um, uh, William Tang, Bill Tang, and his uh, uh, team at Princeton 
Uh, and what they're basically doing is trying to use, uh, trying to train neural networks to control the plasma in, in plasma uh, um, uh, fusion reactors, right, tokamaks. And so they've got access to uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a tokamak and uh, they're, they're trying to prepare for this uh, big European uh, eater uh, tokamak that's being built that people think should be able to actually sustain fusion. Um, you know, there's lots of problems. You have this superheated plasma, it's being compressed incredibly uh, in these ma huge magnetic fields. And if it touches anything, it instantly cools and, and it might do some damage. And um, so, you know, they have all these devices that can, you know, inject microwaves or, you know, other, other um, you know, ions to try and stabilize the, 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 the plasma. But they don't know when it's degrading. It happens really rapidly. It's difficult to detect. No person can respond. You know, the algorithmic approach is very difficult just to even detect that the plasma is going uh, going um, uh, uh, awry. Um, and, and what they've been able to do so far is, is demonstrate a huge increase in accuracy and, and, and speed up as a result. And um, so they're actually now, uh, they have a, a, a smaller to uh, tokamak, that's uh, their research tokamak, and uh, they're getting ready to connect the neural network to the tokamak. Uh, and I know that sounds like the beginning of a plot for a science fiction movie, um, but uh, this this could be the path to, you know, unlimited, really inexpensive electricity that has zero carbon footprint. Another control loop is using deep learning for adaptive optics. They're building these enormous com compound mirror uh, telescopes on the tops of mountains. Um, this is the um, uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope, aptly named 39 meters. Uh, it's costing over a billion dollars to build on a mountain in Chile. Um, it's scheduled to go online in 2024, but they're already experimenting with a lot of smaller uh, telescopes. Essentially what they do is, is they fire lasers up in the direction, into the sky in the direction the telescope's looking at. kind of creates artificial stars that twinkle because of atmospheric turbulence. Atmospheric turbulence, even though these things are on top of mountains, there's still a lot of atmosphere above them, and really it's that turbulence that makes the images blurry. Like this is a shot of the moon with an eight meter telescope with adaptive optics off. And then they actually, they, they can analyze the twinkling of these artificial stars they're creating with the lasers, and very quickly run it through some algorithms, and then they deform the mirror. They have an array of actuators that slightly deforms the mirrors to compensate, and you can get really sharp photographs as a result. So they're going to have this enormous light gathering capability and also be able to, you know, much, much larger mirrors than you could ever afford to launch into space. Um, and, and they'll be able to get very sharp images, sharp images as a result. And there's several of these in, in process. And they're using neural networks, training neural networks to look at that, those artificial stars that are being created with the lasers and translate that into the corrections that need to be made to the, the mirror. This one's even more famous and if, if it's possible, even cooler. This is LIGO, the laser interferometer uh, uh, gravity wave detector. And um, you know, these things are the world's most sensitive motion detectors. They're a couple kilometers long laser interferometer, and, you know, they can detect everything, anything that moves within miles and miles of these things, right? Uh, and so the output of the LIGO detector is enormously noisy. And so they've had these denoising algorithms that they've been running in a cluster of CPUs. It's taken like two weeks of latency to process a, you know, a, a, a sample. Um, and that's a lot of latency. What they want to be able to do is what's called multi-messenger astronomy. So they want to be able to uh, listen for gravitational waves 
from some astronomical event like a couple of neutron stars spiraling into each other or black holes colliding or whatever. And um, they have now multiple laser interferometers spread around the Earth. They want to be able to process in real time what's taking them weeks now and be able to triangulate on what part of the sky the wave is coming from. If you have these detectors widely separated on Earth, you can detect which direction these waves are coming from. And then they want pagers to go off all around the world so that people can swing their optical telescopes and their radio telescopes to that part of the sky and try to simultaneously uh, image with photons um, you know, light from whatever the, the event was that caused gravitational waves. And uh, very famously, uh, they were able to do this for the first time about a year ago. Uh, so um, a group at the University of Illinois, NCSA, has been working on, on uh, training neural networks to uh, filter the noise. They, they have... Uh, uh, what you can see here, I'm sorry about the uh, eye test basically, but what they do is they take noise from the actual instrument and they inject a real signal from, from simulation of what the gravity wave should look like. So they're using a scientific simulation to generate a real signal, add it to wave, uh, noise coming out of the telescope and they're training neural networks with that. And there's a couple of, of the algorithms that they were using um, uh, that they were using uh, in the cluster of, uh, of CPUs. And not only are they uh, now with the trained neural network much more accurate, um, I don't, you can hardly see the blue overlapping the black. The black is the ground truth uh, you know, of what you're trying to get. Uh, and the blue is what actually, or the, the black is the denoise signal, excuse me, dotted line denoise signal, the original one is the, the uh, uh, dark blue, and then the light, light what is that, teal, is the, um, the noise. And you can see this is the neural network. You can't really tell the difference between the original signal and the, and the extracted signal post-noise. And you, here you can tell not even close on the other, um, the other approximations that people, the other algorithms that people had hand-coded to do the same kind of denoising. Uh, so not only faster results, about 5,000 times faster than what they were able to do with the cluster, um, but more accurate as well. Faster, more accurate, 5,000 times and more accurate. How often do you get that in HPC? I mean, we're pretty happy usually to get like 2x and, and similar accuracy or you know, modest accuracy increase. So, those are really cool, and they're kind of using the things that we know neural networks, yeah, we knew in 2015, in 2012, uh, that neural networks were good at recognition and classification, putting them into a control loop, that kind of thing makes, makes great sense. Um, in 2015, uh, one of my colleagues at NVIDIA, Chris Lamb, uh, who uh, uh, leads a lot of the, the software organization, we were traveling and he told me about this video he saw and he described it as somebody aimed a, uh, a camera and recorded a bunch of video of, of particles in a fish tank or whatever and they trained a neural network um, to, to infer Navier-Stokes uh, fluid dynamics. That sounded really intriguing but that wasn't quite the case and I kind of looked it up but um, it, this is actually a paper that was published in 2015 at, at SIGGRAPH, and uh, uh, it got me really excited. And so I've been talking about HPC plus AI and, and this technique of using trained machine learning algorithms, trained on data from first principles numeric simulations. Remember that one of the biggest problems in AI is getting a, a well-labeled and sufficiently large supervised learning training set. Well, with scientific simulation, we can create those, as, as many data points as we want, as large of a data set, as varied as we want with our simulations. And so um, what they were doing basically was trying to train uh, 
trying to train, in this case, it was uh, uh, a uh, uh, random forest uh, machine learning. And there's many different parts to it. Part of it is just assembling a model, right? You've got satellites that are observing the Earth. You've got ground weather stations you know, that are sampling it. You've got reports from airplanes. There's missing data. There's gaps. There, you know, you need to interpolate because thing, you know, your reporting stations aren't evenly distributed across the face of the planet on a nice one or 10, 10 kilometer grid or whatever. Um, so what people have been studying is how to use neural networks, generative neural networks, to basically create the model by having it ingest all of these different sources of data, like satellite data, uh, from many different satellites in many different wavelengths, et cetera, uh, and then translate that into a weather model, into the parameters that represent the, so you're taking like the, the radiance, if you will, or the albedo, the reflectivity of the clouds, everything you can tell from, um, you know, from observation. And you're trying to turn it into all the parameters then that you can directly run in a, in a climate model. And so um, people have been doing this. This is uh, work that uh, has been done at, uh, at NOAA. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, bi-directional. Uh, GFS is the um, uh, global, it's a global something system, I'm forgetting what the uh, GFS, it's, it's their climate model though. Uh, so that's their, their first principles numeric simulation. And uh, GOES-15 is the name of the satellite. So in this case, they're taking the satellite data, upper left, and they're turning it into a, um, a, generated, a generated model. These are the generated models, and then these are, are the ones that were uh, um, the, the, the target, right? That's their, their training data set. So they can go both directions. They can take the uh, images from the satellite and translate it to a model, and then to kind of test things, they can run it the opposite direction, go from the model, uh, and then from that, extract what the radiance or reflectance, you know, what the, what the uh, satellite view should look like. And this, uh, this works really well. Um, this is an a, uh, application then that does just that. Uh, and it's basically using data from a number of different satellites, infrared, microwave, visible radiation, taking in data from all these different uh, different sources, and then um, assembling this, this, this model. And it was work that used to, take, uh, used to take a long time, like two hours, to process one day's worth of observations. And now with the trained neural network, they're able to do it in about five seconds. Um, what that means is that you can do this much more frequently, right? Instead of having one hour time steps to your animation of, you know, it, it, your, your, your uh, ingestion of all of the real world data to inform your model, um, you know, you're able to, uh, to do it very quickly, 1400 times faster. Uh, also in terms of, of being able to visualize the results, they're able to interpolate and infer, I'm way behind here. Um, for climate modeling, just modeling the, the uh, behavior of the air column. Uh, they're using neural networks to replace what was human created, uh, almost expert system, uh, parameterization uh, of the model. And uh, this is actually uh, using neural networks to analyze the outputs of climate simulations. They, they, um, this was the 20, one of the 2018 Gordon Bell Award winners was run on Summit at over an exaflop during training. And basically, it's, this is 100 years into the future, and they're drawing lines around all of the, the uh, really nasty stuff uh, that you can expect. So back to uh, CFD, one of the things that we're doing internally is trying to teach neural networks to respect physics, so respect the laws of conservation, mass and momentum, et cetera. And uh, as a result, we're able to, uh, the top is, is the, the scientific simulation, the bottom row is the uh, neural network, and they match very well. And we're now moving on to looking at 
so this goes back to kind of that first example, which was trying to model the appearance of fluid. Now we're actually, these colors actually mean something. They actually mean flow and, and pressure, and so it's, it's, it's real data. So let me, uh, let me uh, line up here for the landing. So um, the promise of HPC plus AI, so better stability and accuracy, you get higher quality simulations. It's an opportunity to get on platforms that are Moore's law fade resistant. Lower precision means you can store more data, have, have larger, uh, uh, larger grids, finer grids, better science. Trained models run at peak speed, right? They run at, at max efficiency on whatever you're on. If that's a GPU, you're running at really high speed. Uh, so you can really accelerate codes that otherwise would be really difficult. Um, you can take a code that's completely serial code and you can use it to generate the training set to train a neural network and then run at 100% parallel efficiency. Um, this is good news for scientists who want to be able to write their codes and not have to worry about creating data structures and, and uh, expressing all of the parallelism so that it can be deployed you know, across thousands of nodes. You're not deploying that code. That's just how you're generating your training set to parameterize the simulation. Um, so uh, you can do better science. Uh, it's also cost effective. Um, the, um, as I said, codes uh, can be created now by scientists and run at 100% efficiency and, and at scale without them having to optimize that code. Also, there's reduced maintenance. Um, Jeff Dean, who heads Google's AI research, uh, told about the deployment of their latest version of their Google Translate. It translates between any combination of 100 different languages. They replaced their old version, which was half a million lines of code, uh, with a new version that's all neural networks, end to end. And uh, it has 500 lines of code. 500. That's, that's the code that specifies the neural network. It's, it's basically specifying the, the training protocol and, and the presentation of the data, and, and the rest is frameworks and your data set. So which would you rather, uh, rather maintain? Um, but the big benefit, I think, as it always is, the, the goal in high-performance computing is orders of magnitude speed up. Right? and uh, lower energy, bigger, longer, cheaper simulations. And this is important, right? Orders of magnitude matter a lot, and we don't know where the next ones are gonna come from. Uh, it's not gonna be from Moore's law. Um, you know, if you try and calibrate what an order of magnitude is, three orders of magnitude uh, you know, is what we'd, what we'd like to get here. Uh, we kind of measure supercomputer performance by by those three orders of magnitude jumps between teraflops and petaflops and, and exaflops. But it's kind of the difference between crawling versus riding in a business jet between SFO and JFK. Um, and so one of, the, one of the pleasures of being a CTO is I get to do CTO math um, that people don't hold me accountable for. It's one step below CEO math. Uh, and so you know, if you look at these grand challenges, Imagine if you can run them 10 times faster, or 100 times faster, or three orders of magnitude faster, uh, with the, basically the same accuracy, the same veracity. Uh, now we're talking about actually being able to do real science and, and uh, you know, create confidence in our simulations that would otherwise be very difficult to achieve. So this is the only beginning, and I'm looking at what I think is probably the, the largest dislocation in high performance computing and scientific simulation that I've seen you know, since the transition from shared memory vector machines to MPPs. This is probably bigger than that, I think. Um, so uh, tighten your seatbelts. Thank you.